Good evening. I'm Kathy Schatzlein, a member of the League of Women Voters of Hingham Steering Committee. Our, the w League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that will be celebrating our 100th birthday or anniversary. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. As an organization, we do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. Through study and consensus, we do advocate for change. We are a three-tiered organization with national, state, and our local Hingham League. We hold candidates forums, the town meeting warrant review, we register voters, meet with our legislators, and hold a variety of public education forums such as this, to encourage all to have a voice in their government. We have a sign-up sheet by the door if you would like to possibly join the League or if you'd like more information. We welcome everyone to join. You can also visit our website. And now Kate Bolin will introduce the panel and explain the format of tonight's forum. Good evening. We'd like to thank everyone for attending this evening's forum and especially our panel who will be providing us with a solid foundation on what to consider when running for public office. And we wanna thank them for running for public office. Tonight we hope you'll take, we'll take some of the mystery out of the campaigning and encourage all of you to run. I'd like to start with introducing our panel and then we'll review our approach to tonight's forum. This evening we have at the far end of the table, Jason Tate, who is the Communications Director of the Massachusetts Office of Campaign and Political Finance. He'll address the ground rules of fundraising, finance, among other important touch points. OCPF is an independent state agency that administers the state's campaign finance laws. The office is available to assist you in understanding and complying with the state statute, and it encourages candidates, treasurers, and committee members to familiarize themselves with these laws and regulations. Next, we have Eileen McCracken, our Hingham Town Clerk. Eileen was first selected as Town Clerk in, well, how many years did you say, Eileen? 1997. 1997. <laughs> Besides Eileen's responsibilities for records, licenses, and permits, and a myriad of other duties, she administers the records management and election procedures in accordance with state statutes. She also acts as the town election official and coordinates all activities relating to the election process for all elections. She will be your first stop in Hingham. Now we're excited to have our three panels. We have Karen Connolly, a brand new situate select woman, Nandita Scott, Dr. Nandita Scott, Hingham Recreation Commissioner, and Sean Guilfoyle, past Weymouth School Committee member for 12 years and chair for 10 years, and also a former candidate for mayor. So here's a quick overview of the agenda tonight. First, we're gonna hear from our town clerk, Eileen McCracken, followed by Jason Tate. Then we'll open it up to questions. I've seen Jason speak before and sometimes questions come from the audience and when people are told to wait to the very end, sometimes they get lost. So I thought that if either of you wanna answer those, we'll take that time. Next, we've taken written questions for our elected officials. They'll span from why did they decide to run to the mechanics of the campaign and what they learned in the process. And then we'll also address questions. Lastly, I wanna thank Harbor Media for recording this forum. We'll be making it available and sharing it. Also the Hingham Public Library. Liza O'Reilly, Kathy, and also um, Katie McBride, who also helped put together some of these questions. You'll be able to view it on the local Harbor Media channel and also on our league's website. So Eileen. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to guide you through running for office, hopefully. <laughs> so after you've decided what position you want and you have some encouragement from someone, which is always helpful because that's how I um, came into my position, um, you can get started by coming to the town clerk's office. At the town clerk's office, you would uh, take out nomination papers. The nomination papers will um, you will take your name and address as registered. 
and um, we will whatever whatever office you're seeking in the length of the term. But first of all, which I didn't say, is that you need to know that whether or not you're registered to vote in the town. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, sometimes that happens that the person isn't registered, so we'll do that first, <laughs> and then we'll we'll go through the the um, nomination papers. The nomination papers at the at one part of it in the, at the top, you have to accept the nomination, so you have to make sure that you sign the that line. Usually, people will take out three nomination sheets. You need fifty vote fifty voters and um, valid voters and um, some people want to have more papers because they want to spread them out a little bit more so that they're able to have um, enough people to sign. Um, you return the papers before the deadline, uh, 49 days before the election, that's usually um, mid-March, and um, they, <laughs> The schedule um, is the same whether or not the, the the schedule is the same whether or not an election is before the town meeting or after the town meeting. If you want to find form some kind of a committee, and usually you should because when you go to the um, to the bank, they'll ask you if you have formed a committee, and there there is also paperwork to fill out for that. After you bring the papers back to the the town clerk's office, they're verified made sure that they are valid vote voters, and then um, we will let you know whether or not you, um, you qualify. And when you do qualify, you just go ahead and, and start running. Uh, you, there's, uh, we have um, two people in the, the school committee this coming year, and uh, the moderator, the selectman, uh, the assessor, board of health, Municipal Light Board, Planning Board, Sewer Commission, Housing Authority, and Recreation Commission. The, um, the Planning Board is five years, as well as the Housing Authority and the Recreation Commission. Five years is quite a commitment. So that you, um, But I suggest, I was, I was lucky enough to have a lot of support when I started, and um, I think that if, if people feel as though they want to run for an office, they should really look into it because it's it's it um, you learn a lot about yourself when you run you learn a lot about the town and and you um, realize that uh, it's a good thing to do for the town and uh, why not <laughs> so after you, you you need to do um, campaign finance and Jason is going to speak to you about campaign finance so OCPF the Office of Campaign and Political Finance is a regulatory law enforcement agency. That sounds bad, right? <laughs> like IRS, DMV, or something like that. Um, in fact, back in 1994, when my boss, Mike Sullivan, first took the job at OCPF, he showed up there, and everybody in the agency, because we were a law enforcement agency, everyone had a badge, and um, you know, like we were enforcing things. And, <laughs> Um, Mike said, we don't need no stinking badges. And so he got rid of the badges and he basically changed the culture of the place. And um, when I came on about 11 years ago, I showed up from a newspaper background where, you know, gotcha stories, gotcha on the front page above the fold. And um, I brought that attitude into OCPF and Mike quickly corrected me and said, we're not a gotcha agency. We're really here to help. So Candidates out there, you're going to be out there raising and spending money, dealing with family and friends and volunteers, putting up lawn signs, doing everything. We hope that you think of OCPF as um, a helpful resource where you can go to us and say, hey, this is my situation. What do I do? Um, and, and, and we'll talk you through that. We really do want to be helpful. We have a team of auditors at OCPF, and that sounds bad too, right, auditors? But they're really there to help. I, I actually sit next to the audit department. Their phones are ringing constantly, and I hear these uh, guys and ladies um, constantly just giving advice, not only to you know statewide candidates, you know Baker's committee, Healy's committee, Mayor Walsh's committee, all you know large ones, down to very small committees, you know selectmen, um, uh, different commissions, different boards on the town and city levels. Bottom line, call us up if you're running for office and you're getting nervous about campaign finance, you don't know what to do, give us a ring. 
Um, and you can even go to our website. All the information is there. But uh, send an email, give us a ring, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you out there. So just a little bit more about OCPF in case you're not too um, filled in on what we do. Uh, I'm just going to address Mike Sullivan. So I said I have a boss, Mike Sullivan. He's appointed in a very unique way. The head of the state Republican Party, the head of the state Democratic Party, the secretary of state, and then a law school dean who's appointed by the governor. So those four people get together every six years and they hire a director, appoint the director. Um, then they go away. We don't report to that little commission. We don't report to the governor or the secretary of state. Um, Mike or whoever's in that seat runs the office for six years and can either be reappointed or, they, or replaced. He's been reappointed five times now, but this is his last year. Um, he's done, he's gonna retire, so I'm gonna have a new boss soon. Um, so we, I already mentioned the audit department, then we have our legal department. They can answer your legal questions, like, I wonder if I can spend campaign cash on this. You know, some, some sort of idea that you have. I wonder if I can spend money on this. You can send an email to our legal department, they'll reply in writing, so you have it right there in case someone questions you about it. We have our IT team, the technology people. Um, they have created what we call Reporter 7. That's the system that candidates use to file their reports on our level. And on the local level, like Sean, when he ran for mayor, he filed using R7 out of Weymouth. Um, on the local level, if you file for selectmen or school committee, you can also use R7. And we highly recommend that you use that, this Reporter 7 system. You would go in, you type in your receipts, click Save. Type in your expenditures, click Save print, sign it, and hand it into Eileen or whoever your town clerk might be. Um, so in order to get Reporter 7, you just have to register at our office. On the front page of our website, ocpf.us, is a news feed. And I try to keep the um, register with OCPF button pretty high within the first five or six news items. So you've, if you go there, just look for the R7 emblem um, as you scroll through the news feed, and you'll be able to register. We recommend that. So some of the um, a little bit more about OCPF. I'm the communications guy there, so I do the website, I do the YouTube, the Twitter, and these sort of like uh, educational things here. A um, uh, little bit of a funny story. When I first got hired there, uh, my, you know, I was with my brothers, and we were just chatting, and they're like, so what is this place? What, what do you do? And I went through this long explanation of campaign finance and what I do there, and you know, um, how we, with the receipts and the expenditures and the in-kinds and all that, and at the end, my brother Daniel, he said, so basically, you just teach people how to fill out government forms. That's all you had to say. You teach people how to, and when you boil it down, that's kind of what we do. Not just me, but everyone at the office. You guys are doing all the work, raising money, spending it, and running these campaigns. We're here to just help you fill out that form so you can get it to the clerk or get it to us. Top mistakes when you run a, when you run a campaign. Wrote a few of them down here. Your public employee friends. Who are public employees? It's anyone who's employed by the state, county, or municipality. In our world, employed means not only appointed, but also compensated. So the person on the planning board who's appointed, but they don't get a stipend, they're not a public employee in our minds. Um, but if they're appointed um, to the planning board and they get a stipend, they're a public employee. School teachers, firefighters, police officers, the folks working that uh, reference desk over there, people who work at UMass Community Colleges, myself, all public employees, and they cannot solicit or receive campaign contributions. So when you're running your campaigns in these various towns, and you know your cousin who happens to work at Hingham High School um, is helping you out, that's great, but what if she on a Sunday sits down and she opens up her Facebook page, and um, she pull pulls up her personal Facebook page, and she says, hey, you know, my cousin Susan is running for um, school committee here in town. Um, my aunt and uncle are having a last minute fundraiser for her, 25 bucks ahead at their home. Hope to see you all there. And she posts that to Facebook. That's technically a violation of state law because she did that. Because public employees are not allowed to solicit or receive. Now, we're not going to throw the teacher in jail or anything like that, but it might end up in that negative news story in the, in the what, the Patriot Ledger. Is that the local paper here? Um, in the Patriot Ledger. Um, and that's what you're trying to avoid. So, you know, I have 15 minutes here, but if you want to look into deeper into this, plenty of resources on our website. Another top mistake, out-of-pocket expenditures. Some people say, you know what, in the past, 
to be a school committee member in Hingham, you have to spend about a thousand bucks. I've got that spare, you know, um, in my checking account. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna even raise money. I'm just gonna spend it out of pocket. Fine, no problem. You can do that. You can use your debit card, pull it out, pay for your lawn signs, pay for your Facebook posts, pay for your mailing. And, um, but it still needs to be disclosed to the public. And so it's reported as a receipt. If I'm the candidate and I use my de de personal debit card, I made a contribution to that campaign. So it's reported a Schedule A receipt, and then the vendors are disclosed on Schedule B expenditures. That way it's like a thousand in, a thousand out, your books balance. So that's something to watch. If you decide to do out of pocket, please make sure you report that correctly. Finally, another problem is just not filing at all. Um, that, that, can, that can actually cost you some money. OCPF only has the power to fine for one thing, late reports. So when your reports are due eight days before the election, and then for towns 30 days afterward, or for um, cities, it's the year-end report. And of course, all town incumbents file the year-end report. Um, if they're late, there's the potential for $25 a day fines up to $5,000, and of course, that negative news story. So just something to look out for. And finally, um, just to sort of close this up, um, on my end, um, the new news. So I'm done with top of the stakes, but anything new, if you, if you pay attention to the Globe and the other local papers, there's legislation right now going through the, um, the State House that was passed by the Senate and passed by the House, but the bills are different, but they would still, both of them would move House candidates and Senate candidates, candidates into what we call the depository system. I don't know, anyone here going to run for House or Senate next year? No, no hands, maybe one, yep, one or two here. If you organize with OCPF today, you're gonna to be in what we call the non-depository system. That's just a trust system where you're reporting everything and there's no way to verify it. If this passes, and it would, if it does so, it would be before November 20th, you would transition into the depository system where a bank reports on your behalf. If all this seems like, whoa, what, what's going to go on? Don't worry, we'll help you through that process, okay? We're gonna send lots of emails, we're gonna send lots of letters, and we're gonna help everybody through that process. But just something to look out for. Um, also on the, in the House version, all mayors, all mayors move, also move into the depository system. So if you decide to give it another run, you won't be in the non-depository, you'll be in the depository system of reporting. Uh, finally, um, there's also some language in the bill that would take another step forward as far as candidates being able to use campaign funds to pay for childcare. As it is right now, if, if you're a um, man or a woman and you wanna run for office but you have little ones at home, you have to pay for your babysitter. But if this legislation passes, um, then you would be able to use campaign funds to to pay for childcare so that you can do campaign activity. So just something to look out for. Um, it, it should be in the news in the next couple of weeks or on our website and in our newsletters. Thank you. I'll give a plug for the league. We are working on trying to get that legislation through. So we've been at the state house on that. So oh, hopefully the childcare, child yeah, as other things. Does anybody have any questions? The, the prohibition on a public employee soliciting or receiving for any political purpose is in effect 24 seven nationwide. Um, for example, I'm gonna get, I've gotten calls like this before. Hey Jason, I'm a school teacher in Haverhill. Um, I'm really fired up for presidential candidate X and I wanna host a fundraiser for that person um, right here on the border in New Hampshire. Um, can I do that? No, you're a public school teacher at Haverhill High School, you cannot solicit or receive for any political purpose. The statute still does not allow a public employee candidate to solicit or receive on their own behalf, and it's very frustrating. You could, yes. Yeah, others have to do it for, for you. He could, we just wanna be careful, you know, that checks aren't sent to the house and things like that. Every, every two years when there's a new legislation, legislative session that starts, someone um, puts forward a bill that would say, public employees cannot solicit and receive. 
But if you're a public employee and running for office, you can do at least do it for yourself, but it never passes. We would consider a married couple, their funds, one and the same. So now we'll go on to um, our three elected officials. Um, and so we're going to just start out with uh, the first question is your basic one is what was your motivation to run for office? I had been involved in situate town government, town uh, politics, uh, PTA, all of that stuff that you do when you're home with you know, a child. And um, I found it very interesting. And uh, I got appointed to the financial uh, plan, the financial committee for the town uh, by the moderator for two terms, and that was six years. So I got to learn a lot about what was going on and budgets and the town meeting, warrant articles, et cetera, et cetera. It was quite an education. Uh, we would spend almost every Thursday night from October until town meeting in the, in the spring working on budgets and warrant articles. So I thought that was a very good foundation. I was then appointed uh, chair of the uh, Community Preservation Committee. I did that for four years and was a member for another year. So I got to know a lot of people. And over the years, occasionally, someone would say to me, you should run for selectman. And I would say, no, 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 no. Um, until finally, uh, last fall, one of the selectmen who was up for uh, re-election he had been on uh, the committee for about nine years, and he was kind of weary. So he said to me, Karen, please run. I will, he said, I won't run, I will run if you won't run, but I want you to run. So I finally took it seriously, and I talked to my husband, and he was on board with it. And then I started talking to friends who all said to me, you're crazy. And, you know, maybe I was, but um, I decided to go ahead and do it because uh, the selectmen decided not to run. So it was really a matter of just being involved in, in town politics for quite a long time and feeling as though, you know, it's the old cliche that you can contribute. And um, so I put my hat in the ring. Thank you. Um, a lot of the same reasons. Parent council, going to school committee meetings, getting involved, watching. Um, unfortunately, at the time, uh, the school committee was a very difficult group of people to speak to, and it got me angry. And I figured I could do a better job, and I'd listen to people, and I did. Um, and I was elected and served three terms. Um, and for mayor, um, quite honestly, out of the very same frustration, I wasn't happy with the way the town was going. I was born and raised in Weymouth, lived there, said I never lived there, but there you go, 40, a few more than 40 years later, I'm still there. I've never left the town. I've never lived outside of Weymouth. Um, so I decided I was going to run for mayor. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to, but um, here we are. And I will say a plug for OCPF. Uh, fantastic. I was in there several times, went right up to the counter. They're very welcoming. If you ever have a question, call. They're very happy to answer them. So I have no prior political experience. Um, I'm an immigrant, and you're probably thinking I'm coming from somewhere exotic, but it's actually Canada. Um, <laughs> and uh, in 2008, I became an American citizen and actually called Eileen like almost the minute I left my the JFK town meeting. I said, can I come register to vote? It's so my very first stop after I got my citizenship papers was to register to vote because I wanted to vote in 2008 election. Um, and then in the 2016 election, um, without getting partisan, I actually realized that um, every person's vote really matters and that everyone's everyone has a say and I'm like and I'm a smart person I think I'm a cardiologist and I'm like I should have some say in what goes on around here and I felt like I had something to contribute to my community so I looked at all the positions and you know I am a cardiologist I'm full-time I have twin nine-year-old boys they were seven at the time I'm like I don't have time to do a lot but I looked at all the committees and I'm like recreation commission is something that actually goes along with what I like which is making sure people are healthy and have opportunities to be active, and I figured that's a great fit. There was no other person of my um, abilities on the commission, so I thought I'd, I'd maybe be a good add to the mix, so that's why I ran. Thank you. The next one is, um, I guess we'll start with you, Nadia. Oh, sure. Okay, I'm trying to be fair here. Um, did anyone in your family or friends um, network encourage you to run or say maybe you shouldn't run, and how did that impact your running? Yeah, I think my husband needed to be on board because we have two little children. And again, this is why this this child care rule is amazing because every time I was, you know, the campaign month can be really busy. 
um, he had to take care of the kids. Um, and he, so he was, my husband's always been amazingly supportive of me, so that was great. I don't think my parents really understood why I would want to do this, because I was already busy. And then people at work, um, same thing, like, don't you have enough to do? But I just felt like internally that I just wanted to do something. And it's, I'm not changing the world, but I'm contributing in a, in a way. On the same same level there, that if things aren't great at home, if you don't have the support of people at, at your house, don't do it. Because it's really, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of effort put out. And then there's also negative comments that come at you that uh, happen every now and then as well. So uh, my wife was fully on board. We talked to the kids. My kids were young when I ran for school committee. They were very young. They didn't really understand it, but they were they were okay with it. They thought they were okay with it until teachers would talk to them in school about school committee, and they were shocked. Not in a bad way, in a very positive way. Um, and same thing uh, when I ran for mayor. I talked to my wife about that, and that was a much bigger discussion, a uh, much bigger platform, and a lot more policies and things to talk about. But uh, I was really not talked out of it by anybody, believe it or not, which was uh, very encouraging. People were very supportive of it. In terms of time commitment, can you talk about time commitment to Ron? And was it different than what you expected? Kieran, why don't you just start? Um, no, I think in my case, my son has grown. He just graduated from college. Thank you very much. Um, so I have time. I, I don't have children at home. Um, I haven't worked in a number of years because I was at home. So for me, it was just a matter of deciding I was going to do it and what I was going to do every day. So every day I sort of got up with at least an agenda. I'm going to get this done today. I'm going to get that done today. So I think that's, you know, that's how it worked out for me. And the one thing I will say is that everyone is an individual and they run their own campaigns their own way based on their own best judgments and I think if I could you know sum it up for me it was that I just knew that every day from the time I uh, pulled the papers until the election day that I was going to be doing something every day I think it's kind of what I was expecting it, it, there was a lot of evenings and weekends at time that I didn't usually have time for anyway but you just you just juggle things around and make time for it it's important in Hingham, it's a really intense month of April. That's the most intense time. Um, other than that, um, so that's only four weeks. You know, it's doable. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you just make it happen. Sean, what about you with the time commitment? Were you surprised by Very, it? Very, actually. Um, I went to a lot of school committee meetings, but I didn't realize how much went on mm -hmm. after the fact and getting out and talking to people and things like that. Um, weekends, where I, the one thing I really loved was going to soccer games to watch the kids buzz around the field to play soccer. I couldn't watch those games anymore. It was all about the, the what was going on and what people weren't happy with and things like that. So I spent a lot more time campaigning than I ever imagined I was going to. I was just wondering, maybe, Sean, you can keep that. I was trying to be equal, so someone would be first, second, third, like we do on forums. But um, Sean, in terms of fundraising, what was your strategy and what worked and what didn't work for your fundraising? Um, I don't like asking people for money, but unfortunately, you do. That, that's just part of it. You, ha you have to ask. If, if people want to see you be successful, it costs money. Yard signs, mailers, uh, postcards, things like that going out. Um, most of it on my school committee meetings, we were self-funded, even though we still had to report it. Um, it was self-funded. On the mayoral side, it was very difficult. I can't tell you how many nights I spent at people's homes meeting with 20 and 30 people at a time talking about it. Um, we did a lot of that a lot of those those parties after after work. Um, and then going out and shaking hands, and uh, I was forced to go to Facebook. Um, and as soon as it was over, I got out of Facebook. I'm not on Facebook, I, well, just while I was running for mayor. Um, so it was, it, it was difficult to ask, but it's unfortunately, it's a necessary evil to ask. To be successful, yard signs are a really, you'd be shocked at how much those things cost when you have to start putting them out. I self-funded my campaign. I did as well, and I had two other opponents that um, also, I think, um, didn't put out yard signs, so it actually made it a little bit easier. I didn't have to spend more money than I needed to, so, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, in terms of this, I'm just thinking in terms of messaging is, um, how did you go around, well, if you didn't have yard signs and you didn't really need to do any messaging like that, but how did you come to develop your stump speech and um, any type of social media that might have helped with that messaging. So I actually had a campaign manager because um, I was I've been in Hingham a decade, but my campaign manager um, had lived here her whole life, and so she really was connected and knew kind of um, 
how to go about this. Also, I, you know, I get on the boat every morning, go into Boston, work, and come back. And so I'm not in Boston, I mean, in Hingham during regular hours. So she could do a lot of that groundwork for me. Mm -hmm. And she kind of helped me with the, the messaging just to make sure that I would write everything out, what I wanted to say, and she would just kind of tweak it and make sure that it um, wasn't inflammatory or, you know, was the right thing to say. So that was really helpful to have someone else from the outside kind of give an independent look at what I was wanted to say. Uh, we did it, uh, do yard signs. I did yard signs because in Situate, they're a big deal. And um, in fact, I was saying earlier that um, we had a challenge to our sign bylaw uh, by um, one of the other candidates. And the ACLU wrote us a letter, the town a letter, saying that they were going to take us to court if we didn't allow people to put up signs whenever they wanted. So after strategizing with legal counsel, the town decided not to enforce the bylaw. So I got a call from the town clerk the day after the selectmen decided to do that saying, go ahead, put your signs up. So I ran around town myself and put up about 40 or 50 signs myself. I had already known a lot of people would put them up for me. And I was waiting for the opponent who had started this whole process uh, for him to have all of his signs up. And it never really happened. So um, uh, as for the message, I mean, I did a website. I had someone who knows how to do websites do the website for me. And in order for her to do that, I had to develop the messages that I wanted to deliver. So I think the idea of having a website or a Facebook page, however you want to communicate, it forces you to define yourself, define what you think the uh, issues are, and come up with credible solutions or you know acknowledgments that there are problems in town. There are problems everywhere. So, and then I did uh, have a whole series of house parties that people ran for me. And, you know, that was another opportunity to further hone your message and to get out there and actually meet people. I think that made the difference for me with the, the house gatherings. Um, in a small town, that's how people hear about you. So as far as the, the messaging and what we were going to talk about, there's certain things that always come up, economic development, uh, obviously labor uh, the salaries in town and things like that but now you have to find the other things and we, there was a lot of nights at my house that we were there for two two three hours about five or six folks the people the main people that are on my committee and we just would spitball things back and forth and then formulate what we wanted to do and how we we're going to get there and then we were very lucky to have somebody that was a real policy wonk that could actually take what we wrote and make sure it was actually okay to do that we weren't just going to come out with these crazy ideas and throw a, a, a bunch of rust into the uh, into the water. So that's how we did it. Yeah, Sean, why don't you then, uh, when we come back, um, who is on your team and do you need a team? Um, I've heard some people say I don't have a campaign manager who is related to. Some say it was better to have a campaign manager related to. Um, who did you feel was important on your team? I had a very varied uh, campaign team. Uh, it happened I had three lawyers on there. And they really beat me up pretty good when I wanted to do something. Um, my campaign manager, believe it or not, uh, I stuck in the same crew. He was a male model, still is, moved to Florida. And he was on me. We were out all the time. He had me every weekend. He'd put me in his car and we'd go. Uh, he was awesome. Uh, I had a treasurer. I had somebody that did communication. I had somebody that did policy. And then my wife was the kind of the one that sat back and said, yeah, that's that's not going to work. You just have to stop talking about that right now. And everyone actually deferred to my wife. She's an incredibly smart person. And the one that I have to turn to for all these crazy decisions, that's like, hey, is that OK? Um, I don't, I don't, with the exception of my wife, there was nobody that was related to me that was on my campaign team because I want to be able to, to allow people to be truthful. And if you say something really silly, you're going to like a fool. You want somebody that you trust that's going to say, you don't really want to say that out loud. But I still said it every now and then anyhow, because why not? And I had a campaign manager, um, and I found that very, very useful for figuring out how to navigate Hingham. Um, and we did actually do yard signs, um, and then we kind of felt that felt things out and decided not to do mailers, and because um, I guess that we felt like that was enough. Um, but um, but I think having someone, if you're not in living in this town forever, to kind of help get your name out there and do the background work was very helpful for me. I didn't have a formal campaign uh, manager or staff, but what I did have, and I was very lucky to have it, were a group of people who I could meet with, and usually it was a couple of people, like Melissa Smith is here tonight, and her candidate at the time, uh, Katie McBride, 
uh, reached out to me and provided me with incredibly valuable information, advice. Um, they couldn't have been more helpful, including up until election day when you have to stand out there with your sign. They were bringing in the troops for me and from out of town, which I was very grateful for. Um, so I would say, especially if you're in a town, you don't have to limit yourself to people who live in town. Um, and I had a group of women, mostly women that I had worked with on various uh, override campaigns. I'm an override lady. And um, some people said, oh, watch out for her. She wants to spend your money. Um, but I've, I've formed relationships, and I consider them, them my <laughs> political friends, the people who you know, I get advice from. And so I think I had one campaign meeting and um, never felt the need to have another one because I knew I could always reach out to these various people to say, what do you think? Can you help me? Am I doing it the right way? And you know, you don't have to do everything everyone tells you to do either. So that would be my advice. I was wondering if any of you had experienced negative campaigning and how you approached it um, from an opponent or anything like that. I did not. I feel like the Hingham process is very um, um, civilized. Um, I did not personally have that on my end, um, um, so no. Without getting into all the gory details, <laughs> I had three opponents, uh, three men. Um, one of them was, I call him harmless. The other one was kind of a hothead. And the other one was what I would call the credible candidate. And he was the one I really felt I was running against. And um, I would say we never went negative. The one thing, if that I actually pointed out at a forum was their voting records. All three of them had terrible voting records in terms of attending town meeting. And I took advantage of that. And um, I felt as though it was, it was true. Um, I didn't think it was negative in as much as it's the tr it was the truth. And some people didn't like that. Um, and uh, I think they were kind of shocked that I said something about their voting records. But I thought it was something that people in town needed to know. And so um, I guess if anyone went negative, it was me. <laughs> we made a decision not to. Um, actually, one of the people on my campaign team wanted to. And he had a list that he came with. We're going to do it. And I'm like, no, we're not. I, I, don't, I don't believe that's how you win. And, and what you did really wasn't all that negative. It was just showing the facts. But this was really negative stuff. And I'm like, no, we're not going to do it. At the, when I ran for mayor, there were six people running for mayor. Um, and one of them, um, he's no longer involved. He ran for every conceivable office there could be and never got one of them. He was, he was kind of a, a loon. And um, he called me up and he said, hey, we're going to go after um, uh, the current mayor in Weymouth, is Bob Hedlund. We're going to go after Bob. We're going to go after Bob. I said, good luck. I'm, have fun. I'm not doing anything. And I actually told Bob when I saw him that night, he's coming after you. Because I said no, we're sitting at a forum, and he attacked me. <laughs> And it, it was just out of the blue. So we chose not to do it. Other members of the, of the people running did do it. But I, I personally don't think there's any need for that. It, if you can't run on what you stand for and what other people do or don't stand for, then it's not worth doing it. Speaking of negativity, Facebook. Um, I, decided, I decided I was not going on Facebook. I would read it just to see what was being said, but I wasn't going to participate. I wasn't going down that road. And there was a lot of negativity on Facebook, a lot. And um, the people who were supporting me kept trying to get me to go on Facebook, on the Situate page, and to you know deal with it. And I just said, no, 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 no. And up until the last minute, I did not do it. And a couple of people decided they would speak on my behalf, but they did it without me telling them to. And that I appreciated that, but I, I think Facebook is terrible for campaigns. I did have a Facebook page, because I think in those, those days, that's how I got the message out. I actually don't like Facebook either. I'm not on it anymore, because um, I think it is a huge um, potential negative um, form. I was wondering, um, one of the things we all have to deal with, and especially the league does that, we register voters, actual be if league members, we are going to be registering at the JFK naturalization ceremonies now going forward. But um, getting the vote out is the really tough part. Everybody loves you. They come to your... Um, how do you get people out to actually vote? I was wondering if you had any tips that you thought 
I mean, I would say from, from the Hingham standpoint, I feel like I am always dismayed at even just town meeting, which is like a huge thing in Hingham because we make we make major decisions as a town that the people of my generation, like like the people with younger children, don't come. And I don't know that they even are aware that this is such a huge um, impact on their lives. So I don't, and and so I think we need to work at that level to get the vote out um, and figure out ways like babysitting, maybe do electronic voting from home, you know, so people can't come because then they're paying, what, $50, $100 for a babysitter to go to town meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if I think if people are engaged in town meeting, then they would be also engaged to vote because um, they know what they're voting for. Well, I think every election is different, and it depends on what else is going on that's on the ballot. Um, so in, in my case, there were three opponents, so that created a certain amount of you know, turnout, and um, we had a an override question on building a new senior center in Situate, which has been going on for ever and ever and ever. And it's, they finally got their act together and really did a lot to try to pull out the vote. So um, I think between the fact that it was a very hotly contested selectman's race, along with the fact that the senior center was a very important issue, created a decent turnout. Turnout of these local elections are never spectacular, but um, <coughs> this was. A, I think about 5,000, which is out of 14,000 voters. But we have the same problem with town meeting that you have. So one of the things that we did is both my sons were at that age. They could both vote when I was running for mayor. So they pushed a lot of their friends to go out and vote. Like, hey, go vote for my dad. Go vote for my dad, which was awesome. <laughs> so a lot of kids did uh, register to vote. Um, and then like I've done, I, I got tricked into this years ago by a, a selectman in Weymouth, Peg Gowdy. She'd call me up on election day and say, Sean, how you doing today? Doing great, Peg. How are you? She's good. Oh, I miss your dad and all that stuff. She goes, I, I was wondering, are, are you around? I'm like, absolutely. What do you need? She goes, good. I need you to go to the Chauncey building and ring buzzer six and take Mrs. Smith down to the polls, OK? OK. So that's something that just kind of stuck. So we made sure that if anybody needed to ride to the polls on that day, we were available. We had people with cars that were kind of going all over town, trying to get people out that had to get out. Um, obviously, signage, but you just got to remember one thing. We were on the hard way is signs don't vote. They're great. It's weird to see a name on a sign, especially when it says, you know, a bigger office you're going for. But they don't they don't walk into the, the voting places and actually vote. And we had a ton of signs out there. Uh, but that's what you got to do. You got to push and you just got to make yourself available to anyone that wants to vote. Um, our last question is, really, once you're in office, um, is there anything you learned about yourself in government and maybe the whole process that you're like, hmm, I didn't, I thought it was going to be a little different, and this is what I learned about myself in the process? So, um, <laughs> so especially going into school committee because... Um, you don't really know a lot that happens. There's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts in the school system of any town, but in the school department, especially with the licensing issues and, and everything, there's just a lot going on. Um, I was kind of shocked that I, I felt I was very well educated on the process and what happened, and I didn't have a clue, uh, to be honest. And I relied on the superintendent quite a bit, and and he was awesome, uh, and it taught me a lot of things. But there's nothing like you have to educate yourself. You know, you have to really kind of buckle down and, and figure out what your job is. You know, a school committee member, it's not their job to try and correct teacher action. You're a policy board. That's what you do. And it, it's trying to stay inside your lane, too, at the same time. So, And I learned I could actually um, sit down for more than a few hours and not swear, <laughs> which my wife was very impressed. For all those years, I did it for 12 years. I never once. So... Well, I think when you're on a, a board, as I am, it's in a situation it's five people. Um, I think the first thing I realized at the at the first meeting is that oh, I'm just one of five, right? So you go from being the candidate, where everyone's listening to what you have to say, and you go to being oh, I'm one of five. Now, that's fine until you realize that someday you may be the swing vote mm -hmm. on a really important issue. And that happened to me within two months of being on the board. And it was really hard. And it was really eye-opening. And I knew when it was done that a whole bunch of people could be really upset with me. And another bunch of people could be really happy with me. And I think you have to learn to live with that as, you know, we all want to be liked. And to realize that you're going to have to make a decision 
that is going to cause some people to not not just like you, but to be very angry with you. So um, I think that's been the most interesting part of it for me. Yeah, and I would say that um, what I learned was that um, there's a way if you want something done to word it so that um, no one feels challenged and like you're opposing them and there's a way to manage people and make sure everyone's hurt, feel like they're listening even though you may not agree with them. So I feel like part of me came with those skills, but those are skills that I actually got better at. Um, I'm still trying to be a nice person, but still making decisions and opinions um, and making everyone feel like they're heard. Is there any um, thing you'd like to say to encourage people out there um, that they to run for office or anything like that that we might not have asked as a question? Um, so I would say like I probably am one of the people that on paper has no time to do anything, um, but but contributing to community when you have certain skills I think is super important. It feels to me that it's actually been very, um, um, I feel like it's really been very additive to my life and I think that we should be encouraged also a lot of younger people. I see those two young people in the back row. Um, you should run for office. Um, you'll learn a lot and um, I encourage you because we need you guys too. And I would say you're never too old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I uh, signed up for Medicare the month after I got elected. So, you know, you might think, wow, what, what, why is she doing this? But I say as long as you think you have something to do and something to say and you have the energy and you, you're interested, it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are or how busy you are or how not busy you are. I just think if it's something that you think you want to do, I say go for it. Jason, my question is to you is what happens to those funds after someone doesn't run again? So sometimes um, you run for office and you unfortunately lose, but you still have a balance left um, in your account. Or sometimes you're in office for some period of time and then you just decide not to run again. You still have money left over. You can keep your account open indefinitely so long as um, you feel that you might run again in the future. But when the time comes when, hey, I'm done with this and I'm not ever going to run again, yeah, you go through what's called a dissolution process. You, you can pay off any bills or any debts. Usually the debt is owed to the candidate because he or she put their own money in. Um, but then once the debts are paid off, let's say you still have money left over, it can go to one of four places. Um, you can give it to the state, which has never happened <laughs> in the history of campaign finance. No one's ever given it to us. It hurts our feelings. Oh, thank you. Um, or you can give it to a city or town, like a school department, that happens, charity or a scholarship fund. And that cleans you out and, uh, and you're, you're, you don't have to file any longer. Well, thank you very much. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, please look for this on your local cable as well as League of Women Voters of Hingham. It will be on our website. And thank you very much.